Tonight on Free Minds TV, the Supreme Court rules in on the FCC and what you can and can't say on TV. I say f them, but we want to see what you guys have to say. We're also going to be getting into the downsizer dispatch and an article about police being allowed to taser children in the UK. We'll be getting into that and a whole lot more all tonight on Free Minds TV. And welcome to an all new edition of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. All right, Nick, I want to get into the FCC. I don't know about you, but I don't like these people. I think that it's one of the more useless federal programs that we have here in America. Um, it's, it's set up to, to regulate the airwaves to make sure that there's not too many stations um, in one on one part of the dial, um, stuff like that. Regulate all parts of the airways, cell phones, um, when it comes to walkie-talkies, when it comes to CB radios, anything that's the airways, the FCC, well, they're pretty sure that they need to regulate it and make sure that not, not only is, do people pay them the money and beg them for permission to use such airways, but also naughty words aren't being said over the airways. Yes, and they also um, they seem to regulate cable to, to some extent. To a certain extent, you know, um, they've been trying to work their way into satellite and cable more and more. So far, um, you can still say more that you, on cable than you can on the regular airwaves without the FCC coming down your throat. But um, really, what they want to do is play mommy and daddy for everybody in America. And I don't don't think that it is the government's job to play mommy and daddy and make sure that you're not cussing or saying bad words on TV. I mean, it just doesn't seem like the job for the government to be doing. Right. I mean, certainly in the case of TV, you can block certain channels. Um, I mean, at least if you get it via cable, which most people do these days. I don't know too many people who actually get their television from broadcast TV. I guess some people do. But regardless of that, just because it's being broadcast on the electromagnetic spectrum doesn't somehow override the fact that it's still free speech. I mean, you can shout obscenities with a bullhorn, but you can't actually broadcast it over the airwaves? Yeah, it's, it's really weird. I don't know how it passes, passes constitutional muster. It, it seems like it kind of flies in the face of the First Amendment, but uh, we don't elect these FCC officials. They're appointed. They're, it's nothing that they're not going to be voted in or out of office, so they're, they don't really care in that respect how they're treating the, the public, which is kind of strange to me, because while they're not voted in, they sure do regulate a whole lot and make a whole lot of rules that we're all supposed to follow. Uh, they, they can create huge, huge fines in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're saying bad words on TV or you were creating a pirate station where you're illegally broadcasting some radio station or something like that. They create huge problems, yet they're not elected officials. They're appointed, they make rules and laws that elected officials are supposed to be making according to the Constitution, but they're not elected. There, it's just one of those bureaucratic branches that gets to make rules willy-nilly. And certainly, I mean, some people think that if you got rid of the FCC, all of a sudden there would be pornography on, uh, on television in the middle of the day. And I just don't think that's the case. I mean, most channels... Consumers don't want that. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean they have their pornography, pr pornography channels, but for the most part, consumers want, want certain things, and advertisers want to advertise certain things on channels. I mean, an advertiser of Ford Motors isn't going to be advertising on a channel that's showing porn. They're not going to be advertising on a channel that's not going to be family friendly. This is, these advertisers uh, are listening to the consumers that are telling them things. And the, for the most part, the, some parts of the public demand certain things. But I think that the airways could regulate themselves. Right. I mean, for the most part, you would see if, say, ABC was faced with the decision of whether or not to run pornography, they'd probably lose more sponsors than they would gain in terms of advertising dollars. So it would self-regulate. And I just don't think there's that much of a market uh, for that kind of material, not that much of a market. And certainly if you're not receiving, tele I mean, advertiser supported television is broadcast television. So if it's being broadcast on a frequency and you're receiving it with an antenna, then the, the only way that station is making money, at least on that side of their operation, is 
through advertisers. So it's self-regulating there. And if it's coming through a wire into your house and you're a cable subscriber, well, you subscribe subscribe to the service. So you can cancel the service and depending on what package you have, you can drop the channels that you find offensive in certain cases. So really, the, the market and people making individual decisions, I think, would regulate it. People, Americans, I think, have generally better taste than some people give them credit for. Sure. And uh, it would actually give some parental responsibility for regulating the TV remote rather than relying on the government, which is a horrible, horrible parent. I don't know why people rely on the government government to make sure that their kids are watching uh, wholesome things on TV or listening to wholesome things on the radio. It seems pretty asinine to me, but hey, uh, your, your I children, guess I'm not a parent. I, yeah, and if you are a parent, you, you might want to consider not having your kids watch all that much TV anyway. Yeah, it's I mean, probably not good for you. Shut it off. Uh, well, unless you're watching us. Anyways, <laughs> let's get into the article here, and it has to do with the Supreme Court finally ru ruling in on some stuff that the FCC is doing, and uh, no, unfortunately, it's, it's not on the First Amendment. The Supreme Court's apparently fine with them violating the First Amendment and the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, but it is on some of the uh, rules and laws that the FCC is making, and that has to do with the one swear rule. Um, a lot of live events, sometimes the broadcasters can't control if there's a swear or a slip up, and it sometimes goes out on the airways. Well, the FCC has made a rule, or a law, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of convoluted because it's not written by our representatives like laws are supposed to be written, but anyways, this is the new America. Um, well, the, the rule currently states that if you swear once, you can get hit with a huge fine. I think it's up to near half a million dollars uh, for some smaller uh, broadcast companies that could completely turn them under. Larger ones, well, it's, it's still a considerable amount of money. Uh, lower courts have ruled that the FCC cannot uh, distribute these huge fines. If it's a single swear or a single bad word slip up, uh, there would have to be multiple uses of the bad words. The FCC still says, no, nope, one slip up is enough, and that's what the Supreme Court will be ruling on to see what uh, if well, they'll be deciding whether you can swear once and get the fine or it has to be multiple swears. So hopefully the Supreme Court will rule the right way. Some of the justices showed favoritism each way, but it's not really sure which way it's going to go so far. Yeah, and certainly it would be a good thing to limit the FCC as much as possible. I would like to see it go away. Yes. A lot of what the FCC does has nothing to do, I mean, the impact of the FCC has nothing to do with dirty words. That's the focus a lot of people, you know, that's, that's the focus they put on it. But the FCC creates a huge barrier to entry for radio stations and television stations. Their licensing fees are, from what I've heard, in the tens of thousands of dollars just to start one radio station. Just to apply for a license right, costs thousands of dollars. So if you just I believe it's non, one of those non-refundable right. deposits. Yeah, it is. And say here in Keene, New Hampshire, we have plenty of room on the dial for both AM and FM stations, not to mention t television stations, too. I think if you have an antenna, you only get a few stations. There's plenty of room for more stations, yet the FCC doesn't want to grant new licenses. And a lot of markets that have plenty of room, almost all markets at least have some room, some of the bigger cities have less, but there's plenty of room on the dial. Yet, it's almost impossible to start a radio or television station. And it's really just the, them making you beg for money and then pay them tons of money to actually get one of these licenses. Right. And I mean, that's the, unfortunately, that's the way managers of current radio stations would like to keep it, because from their perspective, for, they paid their dues, and you know they had to pay the FCC. They had to handle that barrier to entry, and it keeps competition out of the marketplace. So, some some people who are trying to start up on a small amount of money are less likely to be able to do it with the FCC not granting that many licenses and charging so much to even apply for a license. Right. It, it's protectionism for radio stations that are existing. And then uh, it, it's no wonder that. Uh, radio and television, broadcast television, are on the decline. People are turning to the internet, podcasts, alternative media, uh, internet t television, because, well, there's just not the variety out there because it's prohibited by the FCC. Before we move on, I just wanted to read one quote that I found kind of humorous in this by one of these, these bureaucrats that works for the FCC. They say that using four-lettered words on television is, quote, what gives the word its force. So, you know, using these words gives it the force? No, 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 sir. Banning these words are what gives them the force. If, it was, if there were no 
seven bad words you couldn't say on TV, no one would, would really care. You banning them is what gives them the force. Huh? Pretty genius, huh? Top level thinking there, bureaucrat. Anyways, let's move on. Let's move on to something that we can actually affect because, look, the FCC, they're not elected. The Supreme Court, they're not elected. Not much we can do except watch in horror about what's going to happen with this. But there is something that we can do in Washington, and that's at least let our representatives know what we think. Um, even if it doesn't do all that much, it could do a little bit. At least let our voices be heard. And that's what the Downsizer Dispatch. What's going on this week, Nick? Um, well, th this Downsizer Dispatch was released just before Election Day. So for those of you watching outside of Keene, this is a little, happened a little while ago. It did happen before the election. And Downsize DC wasn't really trying to take a partisan stance on this. Um, they're going to be doing something a little different. Um, they're introducing an impeachment list. Uh, because in their view, they've avoided this in the past um, because they were worried they'd be too controversial and that there'd be a lot of partisan complaints that would go on the list. But essentially, they're going to create a list of laws that are broken by the president or um, constitutional sections that are broken by the president. Um, and you're going to be able to so basically, I believe, sign on to this saying that you endorse impeachment against that particular president. Now, for every person, what warrants impeachment is, is different. I know there's a lot of people calling, uh, who have called for President Bush to be impeached. Um, the train has probably left the station on that since he only has uh, like two or three months left in office. But he did deserve to be impeached. And likely, whoever's president will probably commit some impeachable offense, at least in my book. And the last several presidents, at some point, have broken laws, either misdemeanors or felonies or a whole bunch of both. And they're really not held accountable. And impeachment was put in place when the country was founded as a check on the president, as a check on the executive branch. Because if it's not exercised, the president can pretty much do whatever he wants and get away with it under the authority of his office or her office and that's what they've been getting away with for the last uh, several administrations. I <laughs> like the idea, Nick. I think it's great. I know that there's a, a lot of people out there who believe that in saying that we're going to be impeaching the president is, is harmful. We shouldn't be saying that kind of thing. We shouldn't do that. No, 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 no. You got it all wrong. What we need to do is have all the presidents and all the elected officials on their toes knowing that if they slip up, if they violate their oath to the Constitution, they will face impeaching. I mean, I impeachment. I think it would be great if they were all worried about being impeached. That would actually keep them on their toes and wouldn't allow them to do whatever they want. Because currently, there's not much that's going to happen to them. They're not going to be prosecuted. They know they can do whatever they want. And it's very hard to get an impeachment, I guess, unless you give do something in your bedroom. Uh, I guess it's a little bit easier. But Somehow it, that warranted investigation. But violations of the Constitution. Torture uh, didn't. Torture doesn't violate it. So it, it's a little bit reversed here. But I think that it would be great to offer impeachment to not only the president, but all elected officials. I think that would be great to keep them, no matter who they are, on their toes. So if you want to weigh in on this, downsizedc.org. Uh, sign up for the mailing list and let your voice be heard in Washington. All right, Nick, when we come back, we are going to be talking about using tasers on children. Apparently in the UK, they think it's all right. Um, I don't necessarily agree with them, but we'll be getting into the article. We're also going to be going on uh, talking about some of the voting that happened. We do have a new election that just took place, a new presidential candidate. Not really concerned with that so much, but some of the ballot measures, they are interesting. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Free Minds TV. Free Minds TV is brought to you by Freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. Free Minds TV is brought to you in part by Life Productions for your basic and semi-pro video production needs. From full wedding and event coverage to DVD authoring and distributions. LifeProductions.com. That's L-Y-F Productions.com. Am I on? Am I on? on. Hey, do I talk now? Talk do I talk now? <laughs> I'm Gardner Goldsmith. She's here. And I think she's up by where they're doing the show. You're watching Free Minds TV. Open your mind, baby. Tell others to do the same. <laughs> and
and welcome back to Free Minds TV. As always, it's Toby here with you. And Nick. All right, Nick, uh, we've talked about tasers a whole lot. Uh, this non-lethal force that's supposed to be used as the last ditch attempt before you shoot someone, they're used very widespread beyond that. A lot of the time they're used for just simple compliance with police officers. Previously, they've mostly been used on adults. We've reported a few stories where they're used on children, but it seems over in the UK they actually think that it's okay to use them on kids. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that is the word that's coming out from the, the home office, which is, I, I believe it's essentially their, their Department of State slash Justice. It's kind of different because they're on a parliamentary system. Um, but police have been given the go-ahead to use taser stun guns against children. The relaxing of restrictions on, on the use of the weapons is coming despite warnings that they could cause a heart attack because children are clearly smaller and what a taser does is you basically have metal prongs shot into your body and then it delivers a shock which to most adults um, isn't actually going to pose that much of a risk of a heart attack although there is there are a number of cases um, where it's been documented that tasers have killed adults um, but it's been considered extra risky to use them on children um, and the home office police minister tony mcnulty said medical assessments had confirmed the risk of death or serious injury um, from tasers was low but he also didn't mention that the same study that was conducted essentially by the british government uh, did say that there was a significant risk for children, or a potential significant risk for children. Um, and apparently they actually have an advisory council. The Defense Science Advisory Council ran testing um, computer simulations on whether it would pose a risk to children. I don't know how effective computer simulations are going to be. It's kind of one of those things that seems like you'd have to do it in real life to find out. Um, and that same group was also asked to test the possible effects of taser use on pregnant women. Well, uh, I'm going to just say this, Nick. I, I don't know all that much about tasers. I know that it's unpleasant. I've been, I've been tased once by my friend who had a taser, and it was enough to bring me down. And I'm a pretty big guy. And if it's big enough to bring me down, I'm thinking that it might really injure a kid if you're going to use it on them. Because something that's going to bring me to the floor, and I'm a big guy, is definitely not a good idea to use on a small child or uh, even a older teenager. No, uh, I mean it's really not a good idea to use it on anybody if you don't have to. The idea of it is that it's an alternative to using a bullet. Um, the idea isn't that you just do it whenever you feel like it and unfortunately that is the way that some police officers in some police departments have used tasers. They've overused them and Amnesty International um, is saying that 220 deaths um, have been caused since 2001 in the U.S., and that's just the U.S., from the use of tasers. Um, and that indicates that they aren't quite as safe as some people would lead you to believe. Yeah. Certainly, the, the company that makes them is probably going to try to pitch them as a safe product so that police departments will adopt them and the public and the city councils will let their guard down about it. But that doesn't mean that they are actually all that safe. And the evidence seems to be bearing that out. And I don't know what reason you would have uh, for tasering a pregnant woman. No, it seems it's asinine. Anyways, I, I think that I, I like the idea of a taser if it's really only going to be used as a last-ditch effort before lethal force. But to be used as a compliance tool, give me a break. All right, we did have an election. We went out and voted, at least some of us voted, because some of us don't believe in voting or just don't think it will make a difference. But other people, well, they like to go vote. And while I don't really want to focus on the bigger parties, the federal uh, race, uh, who we have in the state Senate and who we have as president, you know, it's going to be bigger and bigger government no matter what. What I wanted to focus on a little bit are some of the ballot measures that went on in a few different states. Um, some positive outcomes, there were some negative ones as well, but I wanted to focus on something positive from this election because there's not too much positive from it. Well, I guess it depends who you ask, but here on Free Minds TV, it just seems like more bigger and bigger government. I want to look at the uh, a ballot measure that went on in Massachusetts, which was for decriminalizing small amounts of marijuana for just a $100 fine. It would no longer be a misdemeanor, no longer punishable by a jail offense and a huge fine and then a uh, record that follows you around your whole life. It would Now, it's only going to be a $100 fine. So, this, so that's some great news that Massachusetts is bringing um, a hit against the war on drugs. I think that it's 
it's very good that people are finally fighting back against the war on drugs. And rather than waiting for their representatives to go around to doing this, they just decided to take it on their own and do it. It's one of the things that makes me wish that we had ballot measures here in New Hampshire because while over 50% of people polled here in New Hampshire think that we should do the same thing with our marijuana laws, well, our elected officials don't seem to think so and they can't get the ball together and get things started on it. Yeah, and un unfortunately Massachusetts didn't vote the right way, in my opinion, on, I guess it's their state, um, on the tax proposition, which was to get rid of the state income tax, and they voted against it by like, a, I think what I read in the paper was a two to one margin roughly, I haven't looked at the percentages, but that's actually worse than it did the first time. The first time it almost passed with like 45% of the vote. So well, I guess people in Massachusetts do actually want the, the well, higher taxes. They, they should stay there if they like their taxes and not bring their big taxes here. And if you want to pay lots of taxes, move to Massachusetts. But they did make a good move on the Second proposition. <laughs> that, that is true. All right. Also, it looks like Michigan has become the 13th state to legalize marijuana for medical purposes, which is some great news. Once again, the voters took it upon themselves because their elected officials just weren't getting around to it. I'd like to point out that here in New Hampshire, if we were allowed to have me uh, ballot measures, over 70% of people polled, at least by the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense, have said that they approve such uh, measure to be a, a here in New Hampshire. But once again, our elected officials just haven't gotten around to it and have voted it down last time. Hopefully we'll have more luck in 2009. All right, one last thing here is the measure that went on over in Washington State I wanted to talk about where they finally said that it is okay to die with dignity. You don't need to suffer your whole life and die on a, and sometimes drawn out over months, years even, with not living much of a life. It is now okay for patients in Washington State to have physician-assisted suicide, which is some great news over there because why should you have to live and suffer if, you're, if your life is over? You've lived the good parts of your life. It's not the government's uh, job to tell you that you need to live right. the rest in, in agony for months, weeks, years even. Right. I mean, certainly people, especially people at the end of a bout with cancer, people who are in extreme pain, most people who opt for that are at the end of their life anyway. They might have two or three more months, something like that, but they're not going to be spent doing anything except suffering in a hospital bed. So I think that is a good move on the part of the people in Washington, did you say it was? Or was it uh, this Oregon? is Washington, yes. Okay. It's similar to the one that Oregon was operating under that was passed in 1998, which facilitated 341 deaths, uh, a lot of those with Dr. Death, Dr. Kevorkian assisted in, who went to jail for it. But I believe he's not now out, Him who, himself, who is now in the downturn of his life suffering. But anyways, I think it's some good news. I don't think that the government has any business telling people that they need to live those last few years, months, weeks of their lives if they don't want to. I mean, it's their life. It's not the government's life. Do we own ourselves? Just ask yourself that. Do you own yourself? Yes? Well, then you get to decide when you get to end yourself. I mean, it's not rocket science here, people. Anyways, we have one last article to get to. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but I thought it was interesting as to do with GM and more government bailouts. It seems that everybody has their hand out, at least the big corporations out there, wanting the taxpayer uh, to foot the bill for bad business that they had on there. And I wish it worked so well for me if I had a bad, and made bad business decisions, bad business deals. I could ask for some billions of dollars from the government, but not so easy. I guess you have to have some special ties or something. But anyways... Well, you have to be big enough. You have to be big enough. Too big to fail or something. Right. And in this case, General Motors is certainly too big to fail, at least in, in the minds of those who do like government intervention in the market. And it's important to note that this isn't a bank. It doesn't really have anything to do with the overall financial situation. I mean, I guess uh, the credit crunch has affected GM in some indirect ways, but it's really just that General Motors is not running very well as a business. It's not making a profit. Um, and this is the worst auto market in 25 years. Clearly, the financial problem does feed into that. Um, and it, it's claimed that it needs U.S. aid because time is very short. So it needs the aid to stop its collapse. That's what Roger Altman is saying. He's a former Treasury official, and he's advising GM um, as they're trying to um, merge with Chrysler. So this is a guy who worked for the U.S. government, supposedly worked for the taxpayers and keeping track of the, where their money was going, and now 
he's gotten out of the treasury and he's advising a corporation on how it needs to merge with Chrysler and how it needs to take US taxpayer dollars. So I think that illustrates the connections that are usually present. Whenever you have big government, um, they're going to get in bed with big business because you know, bureaucrats aren't paid that well. So you know, they can make money by switching over to the private side and helping pull some strings. And meanwhile, you and I get to pay for this, whereas if I even want to start a business, I need to jump through all sorts of government hoops. Then I have to pay all sorts of taxes. Then I need to fill, have all sorts of licenses and all sorts of... It's very expensive, very hard to even start a business. Then if I make a bad decision, well, I'm on my own, as I should be. That's what America is all about, right? Um, being able to start a business on your own and fail if you're bad at it. But apparently, if you're big enough, the government's supposed to help you out. And it just seems that we're turning into more and more of a socialist nation by the second. Well, when the government starts bailing out your auto industry, I mean, yeah, you're getting into just pretty open socialism. Um, and the idea here is that the impact from a collapse would be so widespread and so bad that it would drag down the rest of the U.S. economy. Well, maybe to some extent, but if the company is going broke... There's probably a reason. There's probably a reason. Maybe GM has had its day, or maybe there's a foreign firm that could buy it up. Who knows? You know? I mean, but that it's not the government's job to be solving every big business's problem. Some of them need to be able to take care of these problems on their own. In fact, I would say that all of them should be able to take care of these problems on their own. And I don't hear of them offering, say, Honda or Toyota the opportunity to get a bailout. Now, some people would say, well, General Motors is an American car company. Well, General Motors is actually, and Ford, have both moved a lot of their operations to Canada or Mexico. They've moved a lot of their production outside the United States. And companies like Honda do produce cars in the United States. I think last time I checked, Honda had something like 10 plants in the US, and they were cranking out cars here. Well, so they aren't co all coming from Japan on a boat. They're actually making a lot of those Hondas that you see on the roads are made here. So the name on the company doesn't really have much to do with who's working in the factories. And the fact is, it's it, a globalized world. There are Americans who own shares of Toyota and Honda, too. There's no, not really any such thing as an American company anymore. Right. I think what it really has to do is who has the better ties with government. Well, that's just about going to do it for us. We're out of time for the night, but we'd love to have your opinion. You disagree with us. You agree with us. You want to weigh in your thoughts. FMTV at freemindstv.com is the email. FMTV at freemindstv.com. I'd like to invite you onto our website, freemindstv.com. There's all sorts of ways to help the show, ways that you can uh, get all the archives of the show, get the updates at freemindstv.com slash updates, and a whole lot more, all at freemindstv.com. It's been Toby here with you. And Nick. Have a great night. So if they cut Free Minds TV is brought to you in part by AnarchyInYourHead.com, a comic about freedom. When it comes to politics, they hate just about everyone, so they're bound to make fun of someone that you don't like eventually. AnarchyInYourHead.com, that's AnarchyInYourHead.com. Log on to FreeMindsTV.com for archives of the show, the Free Minds Radio podcasts, show content and the forum, ways to donate, the members section, contact info, and a whole lot more, all at FreeMindsTV.com.